always thought I was born in the right time, 1940, because I had the advantage of not only going to see Gene Autry and Hopalong Cassidy and Monty Hale and all these people at the theater, but then on television, along came Bill Cody and all the reruns of Reb Russell and, and all the other old 30s Tim McCoy westerns. And then a couple of years later in 53, the television western began. So being born at 1940 and being 10 in 1950, it, ju it just all came together. So I had the perfect advantage to appreciate the 30s westerns, the 40s westerns, the TV westerns, all of them, all in one. And I, I grew up with that. I was always had a writer mentality. I won a creative writing award in, in high school, and a teacher encouraged me, said, You're, you have a talent, you should appreciate it. And that's, that's always encouraging to somebody in high school like that. And it finally just uh, matured itself. And as I did a few other things in radio and so forth, and I enlisted in the service in 1959, went to New York to a radio TV school, which really taught you nothing, was off to Korea for a year and a half in uh, Armed Forces Radio TV, and was on the air the first night, and I didn't know diddly squat about anything, but that's a great way to learn in the service where you're not in commercial radio. You could make mistakes and learn. So I did that for a year and a half, and when I got out of the service, I went into you know, commercial rock and roll radio uh, program director and music director and uh, did that for 17 years basically until the music changed and then I didn't know what the heck I was going to do and I sold insurance and a few things and then along came the VHS machine and I knew where the uh, 16 millimeter films were and a lot of other things and uh, ran one ad in a publication called Classic Images and made more money off of one ad than I did all year, so all month selling insurance and came home and told my wife Donna, I quit the insurance business and she liked to freaked out, but you know, I established Video West for 20 years or more. It sold old westerns on VHS, which was brand new in 77. I mean, everybody, I mean, before you had a 16 millimeter film, if one person owned a Tim McCoy film or a Roy Rogers film or whatever, that may be the only print in existence out there among collectors. Only one person could enjoy it unless he shipped it around. But on VHS, everybody could have a copy of, of, of a movie that they wanted to see. So it, it just changed the world, the VHS machine. And then, of course, DVD came later. I approached Don Key at the Big Reel about doing a column on, on Westerns, and he said, sure, let's, let's do it, because they were selling the ad, they were running my ads anyway. So I wrote a column for Big Reel for several years until Big Reel uh, was defunct, and then I switched it over to Classic Images for about two years, and then I said, well, why not do a whole publication? I've got all kinds of information and pictures. You couldn't do the pictures in in a column in a magazine. So we added photographs and all kinds of other columns. I asked Will Hutchins if he would write a column, and he said, sure. I asked Neil Summers, stuntman, if he would write a column. He did, and uh, over the years we had some 23 columnists that I will mention in a moment that have written columns for me, many of them actors, which I sincerely appreciate that they did it. And uh, we took an issue to the Knoxville Film Festival in late 90, early 94, I guess it was, and to solicit subscription to see if there was enough there to, to warrant a publication. And we ended up with 400 subscribers right off the bat. Well, that was great. It grew to 1,100 over time and uh, beginning to diminish over the years because unfortunately uh, we're losing a few people. But uh, that's how it began, and that's how it's lasted for 23 years. One film festival in Memphis, I had this idea, because I'd gotten to know quite a few of the ladies, one in particular, Lois Hall, that I was in love with when I was seven years old. Matter of fact, that's interesting because, you know, mainly a guy's watching the Cowboys, whether it's Roy or Gene, or in this case, Whip Wilson, and she came on the screen, and I said, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I'm, that's, she's pretty cute. She eventually became a 
like family to us. At that Memphis Film Festival, McFarland was there with a dealer's table. I had this idea for a book on 50 interviews with various Western leading ladies at Republic and everywhere else. I walked over to McFarland, I said, I'd like to do a book on Westerns, are you interested? I said, my name is Boyd Majors. They said, oh, well, we know who you are, sure. It was that easy, I thought I'd have to sell them and they were tickled pink to, uh, I'm very happy to say, to, to do the book. We did two books, 100 interviews all together, 50 in each book. Westerns Women and Ladies of the Western with uh, interviews with Adrian Booth and Lois Hall and on and on and on, Pamela Blake, a lot of wonderful ladies. So that was the, the beginning of the, the book writing. Some of the, um, some of the ladies were certainly more interesting than others. Some, some don't remember diddly about what they did. It was a job and they never, most actors working in the 30s or the 40s had no idea that this would all come back to be appreciated by them. Uh, Peggy Stewart is a prime example. I remember at one film festival somebody asked her, what was your motivation for in this Cisco Kid half hour episode to come in stage left and say to Cisco so and so and, and she said, a paycheck. You know, they don't remember, how in the world can an actress or an actor, either one, remember what they did 50 years ago? I mean, they worked sometimes for a day on a, on a TV episode or even a movie and they're in and out. They don't even know the whole context of the movie. They had their own sides to read and their own lines and that was it. And just some people are more interesting than others. That's, that's a simple fact. So some ladies were, you know, very verbose and remembered everything. Uh, Ruta Lee is wonderful. The gentleman interviews kind of came later and there never was a, uh, a whole book on actors interviews except in this current book, A Gathering of Guns, where I had gathered comments over the years for specific episodes or specific shows so it was all put together for this TV Western book. Certainly there were a lot of stories for the for the B Westerns that are not in there unfortunately but um, but we did other books too. I did one called So You Want to See Cowboy Stuff, which is a history or a, not a history, but a, um, a tour guide of all the monuments, museums, uh, statues, and so forth are all over the country. Um, of William S. Hart or whoever, and the Gene Autry Museum and what have you. And then I did a book on Audie Murphy, uh, the films of Audie Murphy. Um, a couple, I did a series of B. Western I've reviewed every B Western ever made that is existent. There are a lot of films that are lost to the ages, unfortunately. But there was a three volume set on, uh, on B Western movies. Every one of them reviewed honestly. There was a book on Gene Autry we did too, the films of Gene Autry that the Autry uh, Entertainment Office asked me to do. We did that for the Centennial. So every Gene Autry book was, um, every Gene Autry film was in that book along with a lot of history of his radio show and TV show and everything like that. This TV Western book that I've done is probably the last book I will do because I can't think of anything else. The TV Western era was the end really of, of, of the Westerns. You had the 30s Westerns, 40s, 50s, the A Westerns that, you know, took over from the B Westerns in the 60s and 70s and then the gravitated to the TV westerns, so the western now is practically non-existent. There's a big budget one comes along now and then and a lot of low budget crap for another lack of a better word that is done on straight to DVD. But there's nothing else to write about other than a, a brief sequel to this Gathering of Guns book with all the uh, listing and uh, description of a lot of the unsold pilots and so forth. Things are for Western clippings, it's getting harder and harder to find material to write about because I've covered all the TV Westerns, which I did one by one in those various issues, and then expanded them greatly into this book. And I did comic book cowboys. I've covered every comic book 
Western that was made, whether it be the uh, the B Western actors, Rex Allen and Johnny Mac Brown and Bill Elliott that had comic books named for them, and the TV Westerns. I've covered all those, so we're running, I'm running out of material, yeah. There was one incident, Michael Chapin and Eileen Jansen made a series of four B Westerns at Republic at the very tail end of the B Western era. There were supposed to be six, they only made four. And Michael Chapin was Red, and Eileen Jansen was Judy, and they were designed to be a junior Roy and Dale. But if, if you think about the B-Western, you're looking at the action hero, Roy, Gene, Rocky Lane, Rex Allen, the masculine hero. The kids, they couldn't get into a fist fight with Roy Barcroft and Kenny Duncan and these people, so it always had to be an adult in the movie to to do the fist fights and the action. So the series really didn't, uh, didn't last and it wasn't appreciated really by, by B Western uh, the Saturday afternoon uh, kids that went to these movies. Years go by, that's 1952, three. Many, many years go by, somewhere along in the 90s, Michael Chapin called me out of the blue. I didn't know him, he just called me and introduced himself and said, I hear that you have the four movies I made. No, he didn't even introduce, excuse me, he did not even introduce himself. He just said, I understand that you have the four Rough Riding Kids movies that starred Michael Chapin. I said, yeah, I do. I'd like to get them on VHS. I said, why? They weren't really that good. <laughs> and he laughed and he said, I'm Michael Chapin. <laughs> and we la we've laughed about that for 30 years or 20 years or whatever it's been. He's a dear, dear friend. There was an opportunity, the film festivals, the Western film festivals actually came out of comic book festivals. There were some comic book festivals held in Houston and Oklahoma City and so forth where they invited Buster Crab because he was Flash Gordon in the comics and so forth. So there was a natural tie-in and then someone said, well, let's, there were three guys that said, let's create a strictly B-Western Film Festival in Memphis, Tennessee, which was 1972. And uh, Max Terhoon, who else was there? Um, that's a funny story. Lash LaRue was there. Russell Hayden came a year later. Several people talking about funny stories. Max Terhoon came to this festival. And of course, he had the dummy Elmer. And ventriloquism, Max would talk for, for Elmer. Max would walk up behind some lady and either give her a pinch on the rump or maybe just pat her on the, and the, of course the lady would turn around very insulted thinking it was Max and Max would, in Elmer's voice, would say, I'm sorry, oh, and the, of course the lady didn't care at that point because it was Elmer that was doing this. It was, he got away with it pretty good. But there were a lot of B-Western uh, celebrities that came, Eddie Dean came and with that glorious voice of his and sang. So I had the, again, right time to be born. There was a character actor named Walter Reed who was full of stories. Uh, I'd have to go through a litany of names to remember who told the great stories. Again, like the women, some of them were, didn't remember anything, had no idea that they would be asked these questions 50 years after they were on screen. Uh, some people were very verbose with stories, some weren't. I just. Uh, Don Redberry was full of himself. Um, I remember one incident where a group of us, seven or eight guys, were sitting along about midnight watching the Adventures of Red Rider serial at a film festival in 16 millimeter. And through the action scenes, Don Berry is saying, oh my God, look at I came off of that roof and I punched that guy and then I jumped on the horse and rode away. And we're sitting there knowing Don is full of baloney, it's Dave Sharp doing all this stuff. But the kicker was Don knew that we knew and we knew that he knew we knew. And it, but he went on, it just didn't make any, he's putting on a show for us. But I wanna pay tribute to all the contributors, the people that have made Western clippings over the years. I, I hadn't thought about it in a long, long time, but Mark Lawrence wrote a column for us. Mark Lawrence was a gangster in so many movies. You wouldn't think of him in Westerns, but he was in the Oxbow Incident and many other Westerns. And he wrote a 
column for me and an interesting story about Mark. He could be very blunt and straightforward. His column was getting off a little bit and he was writing about Marilyn Monroe and uh, Broadway plays and I called him and I said, Mark, you're getting a little off base. I mean, this is not really a Western. He said, well, my not GD column and I'll do whatever the F I want to do in this column. And I said, no, you won't. This is my publication and it, I want to want you to write about Westerns. Well, it got more and more heated as the conversation went along and there was a lot of FUs back and forth. And then there was a pause and he said, Boyd, I love you. And that was the end of that. And, you know, it's, it's, um, he was tough and I had to be tough, but it was, we remained friends then. It got past that and he got back to writing about Westerns. So, great guy, great man. There's a columnist, Tinsley Yarbrough, that started writing about locations. He is the ultimate uh, aficionado, ultimate connoisseur on, he knows every Western location that's ever been used and every building on that location. He wrote the locations column for Western Clippings for years, and then he felt he'd written all he could write, and he quit. And somebody else, uh, um, uh, Carlo Gebersack from Italy, and uh, his friend Ken Steyer took it over for a long time. And then recently I asked Tinsley to, if he'd like to come back and finish out whatever's left of Western Clippings for two or three years, and he said yes, so he's back again. Neil Summers, who is a great stuntman, has written a column first on all the wonderful stuntmen that worked, Tom Steele and all the others, Yakima, Connett and so forth, Dave Sharp that worked in all the films, uh, the background and history. And now he's doing a column about specific movies, westerns that have been overlooked. I mean, we all know the high noons and all the classics, but he picks out certain ones that are, have gone under the radar, as he calls it. Um, Richard Smith wrote a column for us a long time on various movies, especially about uh, some directors and Sons of the Pioneers and different people. Michael Fitzgerald wrote a column on interviews with the leading ladies, which we worked together on these two Westerns Women and Ladies of the Westerns book. And Will Hutchins, Sugarfoot, has been with Western Clippings since the beginning, 23 years. He's written a column and never missed one. Bobby Copeland uh, contributed a column of just quotes and anecdotes from, from everybody that he rounded up from talking to people and reading old publications and what have you. Michael Pate, who was a great heavy in, in a lot of A-Westerns and TV Westerns, Australian, but he worked in Westerns, wrote a column for a while. O.J. Sykes has written a music column for us for years. Tom and Jim Goldrip have written a column on character actors interviews for years because they did several books on character actors. Ty Harden Bronco wrote a column for us on for a short while. Dusty Rogers wrote a column about Roy and his dad and all the things associated with that he was trying to get going with things that a lot of them didn't happen and then uh, when they moved the museum from Victorville to Branson he felt he had to spend more time with Branson and so he turned it over to Cheryl and Cheryl wrote a column for a couple of years. Bill Russell wrote a column on silent westerns because we tried in western clippings to cover all the way from silent westerns up till uh, now in, in the reviews of whatever's coming out these days. Bob Nero did a column on just uh, anecdotes and what have you. Mike Nivens wrote a whole group of columns on directors, including Bill Whitney and all the other wonderful directors that did B-Westerns and has turned them into a book. Tom Weaver did much the same thing. Johnny Western, uh, who sang the Have Gun, Will Travel theme song, graciously took his columns that he'd done for a, what was it, horse and rider, or Western horseman, one of the horse magazines years ago that he'd done, and we redid all of those columns. Phil Loy has done a very interesting column on various aspects of Westerns. Um, John Brooker from England has incorporated a lot of trivia into his column. And David Fuller, I always wanted a column on music, the background music in the, in the Westerns, whether it be B or A or television. 
and never could find anybody that knew about these composers and how they worked and what their history was. And one day, this guy called me and was asking a few questions. We got to talking, and I realized he knew some of these people, a lot of these people, and knew their backgrounds. And I said, David, would you like to write a column? And he said, I'd be glad to. And he, instead of writing one a month, he turned in about 30 different columns all at once, so I was set for years. So it's a lot of wonderful people have contributed to, to the magazine. You're never going to see an era again as we had in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and the television westerns in the 60s and early 70s. Um, it was a different America then. Uh, patriotism. Look what happened in World War II. I mean, you know, the biggest stars, Jimmy Stewart on down, uh, enlisted and left their careers and went to, to fight in the war. I don't think if we had a war like that today that uh, these people would, would do that. I, I don't know, maybe they would, but shouldn't say that. But the feeling in, in the country is just totally different than what it was then. Every, it, there was a patriotism that uh, doesn't seem to exist anymore, sadly. Uh, so we, uh, those of us that grew up in those years, I think, uh, notice that today, and it's, uh, it's, it's a bit of sadness to it. But Roy and Gene and Hoppy and Rex Allen and even the lesser ones like Bob Custer and Bill Cody on down, Rev Russell, they, um, there was a moral value to all of those Westerns that uh, doesn't exist anymore. When, when that era left us, you got into the, um, uh, the black and white, so to speak, uh, what's the right term, but um, the Steve McQueen era, for lack of a better thing. Um, it was good and bad all mixed together. And now there's, a, you know, we're glorifying the anti-hero, uh, and it's not, not right. Spaghetti Westerns um, changed everything, too, when uh, Clint Eastwood made those three films for Sergio Lere Leone. They were good movies, they really were, but all the offshoots of them were crap, in my words. Uh, the gunshots didn't sound right, the locations weren't right. I mean, uh, the hills of Germany and Yugoslavia don't look like our real West any more than a lot of the Westerns in recent years have been shot in Canada with the rainforest and everything else. That doesn't look like Arizona. Uh, if you don't have the right location, you don't have the feel of, uh, of the West anymore. You can't make a Western anymore because you don't have the Wranglers, you don't have the Cowboys, you don't have the stagecoaches, you don't have the people. A lot of the people that were in the 30s and 40s Westerns like Bud Osborne and people like that came off the range into Hollywood to make a better living than they were driving cattle or whatever, driving stagecoaches. And, uh, you know, they were real cowboys. You know, you don't have that anymore. You just don't have it. You can't do it. The, the Westerns they're making today, when they made the Young Riders TV series, you could see more daylight between their rumps and that horse. I mean, they, they couldn't ride, but yet they were the stars of the show. They didn't teach them to ride. They, had, you know, they just didn't. So you can't do it today.